All right. Well, welcome guys to uh, this brand new class, uh, the uh, School of Christ class, CMI School of Christ. Before I get started in this, let me just remind you, as I've been doing for a while now, of the upcoming uh, Bible conference here in Leslie, Arkansas. Um, do it on this one. It's the 21st through the 25th of June, coming up pretty quick. Be here before we know it, especially those of us who have to <laughs> get ready for it here. The last full week of June 21st, well, I'd say uh, the Monday through the Friday of that week anyway, we'll be having this conference, Bible conference, and we've already heard from several who are planning on coming and being a part and being with us, and we're excited to uh, be able to see some faces that we haven't seen in some time um, and to, you know, just sit down and have times of sharing and fellowship with some folk and looking forward to that. So if you are in any way thinking about it, please um, let us know if we can help you. There are limited places to stay here. There are some, uh, we were looking at some Airbnbs that are in the area. There are some of those still, if you go to Airbnb and you pull up Leslie, Arkansas or Marshall, Arkansas, um, there are some Airbnbs that are available. If some of you can come in a, like groups and get together, I know a lot of you know one another. Uh, if you can get together and, and, and share places, because some of them have several bedrooms and that would be a more economical way to do it. There are motels and uh, there's some in, couple in Clinton, Arkansas, and we'll be getting that information out to you. In fact, um, try to do that this week and get that to you by email and let you um, know what's out there. Again, I'll give you the link to the Airbnbs, but there are too many to really list on a page. So you can go to those links and see them and uh, do whatever is best for you. We just look forward to seeing as many of you as possible to be here and just to be able to have time to uh, share with you. For me, it's not as much about uh, getting up and, and, and sharing as it is to just be, be with people and have time to share and, and just fellowship with folks who come. That's always the best part of the best part of the week for me. So, all right, with that being said, guys, we're going to revisit what we did last, uh, last Wednesday with regard to the sovereignty of Christ or the sovereignty of a King that rules his, his kingdom, his domain. And I'm using this with regard in reference to uh, the soul of man. We've been talking about the dominion of Adam over the soul, the headship of Adam, and we dealt with the headship issue of Christ and Adam. Now we're dealing more with the king and a kingship uh, that is exercised over the soul. And we do that because in Romans chapter five, where the headship is also a matter and, and chapter seven, of course, of the husband and the wife. In Romans chapter five, Paul's language turns to that of kingship, of that of the rule of a king in a kingdom. And so let's read that just a second. Now, Romans chapter five, verse 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, meaning the law came in so to show the abounding nature of the offense. Now, again, we're not talking about offenses because as we've said before, this is a singular word. It's one offense, that offense by which all men born under the rule and headship of the man of offense, Adam, were constituted sinners due to that one offense. And there were, there's a universality of consequence based upon that offense. And the law entered in to show the abounding consequence of that offense, meaning the abounding of the sin that has been uh, inflicted upon all and death that has been inflicted upon all through that one man's uh, offense and one man's headship. But 
Thank God there's that. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Of course, in the last class, we talked about those two words, abounded and much more abound, meaning abounded means to have all that you need, everything that you need, no, no additions necessary. So this is related to, to the word sin, to, the, to sin and death and corruption, meaning there was not one thing that we had to do as far as actions on our part to be sinners. When we were born and constituted, that was made to be by another man's uh, governmental authority over the soul, that our soul was constituted as sin, as sinful, as full of sin, and death, reign, and rule. We'll see that in a moment. So we had plenty. We had more than enough to be constituted sinners. We didn't have to do one thing to add to that, nor could we. And we definitely couldn't take away from it. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned, here's the, the kingdom terminology now coming in, reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now this in the Weymouth translation, verse 21 in the Weymouth translation, says, in order that as sin has exercised kingly sway in inflicting death, so grace too may exercise kingly sway in bestowing, here's the difference, inflicting and bestowing a righteousness that results in life eternal. And to not get into all that we said in the last time together, let me just say it this way, because this is going to be important as we, as we go today in this lesson. And I'm going to try to take my time because there's some things I want to touch uh, in this lesson that's weighty and it's become more and more on me weighty to be able to convey the thought as clearly as possible. And I understand that we can't make you see Jesus. We can't make you see the truth. Je only God can do that. Only God can reveal him in you that you may see in total clarity. But I want to at least not allow my words to get in the way and to say it as clearly as possible. When we assess the nature of our salvation in the light of the king's rule and reign. One thing is certain in the reign of a king, is, that, and that is that the subjects of that kingdom in no way influence the sovereignty of the king, no way influence the efficacy of his rule. They are subjects without the ability to uproot anything with regard to his dominion. Those who are subjects have no power to rescind the king's exercise in the land of his reign. He's not open to the notions of his subjects. He is not, uh, he, he does not necessitate or bend to their consent. The nature of the man, the man who is upon the throne, utterly exclusively without any qualification at all, he alone determines the condition of the realm over which he rules and has dominion. Now that starts us off, but what I want to do is go now into first Chronicles chapter 22. And this is, this is a beautiful picture of the kingdom of Solomon, but again, always pointing to the kingship of Christ, the greater than Solomon. 
And I think this very thing is seen plainly in Solomon and how his being on the throne determined everything for those who were the beneficiaries of his reign. Say it that way, because that's really, truly what it was. In 1 Chronicles 22, um, verse 9, Behold, a son shall be born to thee. Now, this is, of course, is uh, God speaking to David with regard to Solomon. A son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest. Hear these words, because this plays an important role in, in, the, in the kingdom of God within, the rule and reign of the beloved of God within the soul that is born again, that is born of his spirit, born of God, which means the kingdom of God has come unto that soul. He is a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all of his enemies round about. Now, who does he give rest to? He gives it to him, that son who is a man of rest, for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. It's kind of the same idea as when Paul always takes the beauties of our salvation and never fails to contextualize that salvation of saying, this is so in Christ. This is so through Christ. So the peace and the quietness that God gives unto Israel is contextualized by this phrase, in his days, the days of his reign, the days that he rules that land, there will be quietness and peace. What a beautiful thought. Again, always understanding this in the light of the salvation that we have in Christ, who is king of this kingdom that is in us. He shall build a house for my name and he shall be my son. There's the foreshadowing. And I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Notice, the man whose throne is established over Israel, he is a man of rest. He has no enemies around about him. He is God's son. And this leaves no doubt, again, as, as to the testimony being according uh, with regard to the greater than Solomon Christ. But pay close attention to the condition of those under his rule and how such a case exists with regard to Israel's condition. I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. The complete Jewish Bible translates it I will give it unto Israel during his reign. I will give peace. Peace, shalom, quiet. And you'll notice the word peace is shalom. The peace presented here it, by definition is a word that actually means completion, fulfillment, wholeness, and security and safety. The land that is sovereignly governed by the man of peace and the man of rest, the beloved of God, because you remember Solomon's name was also Jedediah, which means beloved of God, and we are accepted in the beloved. That land that is governed by that man enjoys a continual condition of tranquility, which alleviates any reason for concern or uh, upheaval, or doubt, or worry with regard to the condition, with regard to enemies, because as long as he's there, as long as he's present and rules that land, there are no enemies, because God's given him rest from all enemies. He hadn't given his subjects rest, but he gave the king rest from all enemies. Therefore, the, the land that he rules is the beneficiary of the condition of the man who rules it. Listen to these words carefully. And such is the characteristics of the salvation we have. 
citizens of his domain, citizens of his reign, servants under his rule. And that is why our ignorance of Christ's sovereignty and his reign robs most believers of the enjoyment of that immeasurable divine bestowal of the grace of God that has caused our soul's condition to be peace, rest, quietness, having no enemies. To me, this refers back to Romans chapter 8. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Again, this has everything to do with the design of the soul. The soul was designed to be the place of the rule of a sovereign king, the place where a man of power and capacity would take up residence and govern and rule that soul, because that soul had to have a stronger party exercising his might within it. Not by power, but by his spirit. That's how the soul was designed for that very function of God to not only make something so, but to sustain it as so. Romans 8, we go back to there a lot, verse 3 through 4. What the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now notice again how everything in that context of Romans 8, 3 through 4, every necessary action was performed by God himself, not by men, but by God. Romans 7 shows you the struggle of a man trying to perform through the weakness of flesh and the weakness of the law due to the flesh, trying to perform this. God had to do this because man could not. Why? Because at all times, that man trying to do something contrary to the government that was in him could not make it so because the government within him was stronger than any action on his part. The government within is always, always victorious. Always. And that's whether we're talking about in Adam or in Christ. And that's a big, it's a big debate, right? Because most of the time we don't believe that in Christ. We believe that with Adam to some degree, but we don't believe that with Christ. We don't believe that the internality of his rule overrides all of the externalities of this vessel. It's not an excuse. It's just true. And I, we'll talk about that. And that's because that is why this vessel can live in contradiction at times to the rule of that king. But that's why we can always come back to the throne of grace boldly. Because we know that whatever thing the vessel has done that is contradictory to the king's rule and the condition of the domain of his rule, it has not in any way upset and overcome the dominion and rule of that internal government. So what grace has provided. So we can come boldly to that throne of grace, the place of his enthronement, and throw ourselves upon that throne and, and lean upon it as the place of our safety. Knowing that nothing of our salvation rests upon the ability of ourselves to do it or keep it or sustain it, but it rests entirely upon him enthroned by God completely, entirely. His presence determines this. It's 
but I don't understand just how our souls are the beneficiaries of one man's sovereignty. What could not be done by any other, what could not done, be done by any other means has been accomplished by God through the putting away of sin, through the death of Christ, the raising of him as the victorious king of all, and now him ruling, reigning in a soul, born of him, and accomplishing in that soul, bestowing to that soul the righteousness that God demands. The righteousness the law described and demanded and commanded now fulfilled in us through the presence of Christ himself. Not us, but him. This is a matter of divine sovereignty. This fulfilled righteousness is actually the gracious bestowal of a kindly king, rendering to the soul, bestowing, imputing to the soul what the soul had no power to obtain itself and still has no power to attain. Paul writes it very plainly in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. As for you, this is uh, from the Weiss translation, as from you, uh, I'm sorry, as for you, out from him as a source are you in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom for us from God, both righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that even as it stands written, he who boasts in the Lord, let him be boasting. See, that boasting in one who has done in us what we could not do. The boasting that the fact is God alone has done this. He did it all. Look at how it's worded. As for you, it is out from him as a source that you're in Christ. Before, before we go on in this, we have to consider a couple of other verses, okay? Uh, with regard to Solomon. And I want to get this across of how the condition of the land, because this is going to be important, the condition of the land, the kingdom, is solely determined by the fact that Solomon himself reigned as its king. Nothing else. Nothing the subjects did. Nothing with regard to the subjects. Nothing at all other than God had set his son on his throne and gave him peace and rest from all enemies, and therein the land of his reign benefited entirely from the singularity of that man's rule and his condition. That man's condition was the benefit of the land he ruled. The land could not be in one condition, and the man who reigns in that land be of another. I want you to see that. It's important. First Corinthians four. I'm sorry. First Kings four. First Kings four, verse twenty four and twenty five. For he had dominion over all the region on the side on this side of the river, from Tifsa even to Asa over all the kings on this side of the river, and he had peace. Here's the thing. He had peace on all sides round about him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely. Every man under his, under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. Again, meaning all the days of his rule. And again, Again, a testimony of the greater than Solomon ruling in you as king, his kingdom being present in you. Peace on all sides and dwelt in safety. First Kings 5, verses 1 through 4. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father David. For Hiram, was a lover of David 
Solomon sent to Hiram saying, thou knowest how that David, my father could not build a house unto the name of the Lord, his God for the wars, which were about him on every side unto the Lord, put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord, my God hath given me rest on every side so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. Look at that. This is the, this is the work of the cross being explained here. Most under, it is unfortunate that most who are under the rule and government, the kingship of the greater than Solomon, in their minds, in their perspective, as taught by many people to them, there's still wars raging at every turn, at all moments. The wars are still going on. There is no rest. There is no uh, uh, peace. There is always an adversary, always something evil occurring. The Lord is still constantly fighting enemies, and the adversary is constantly on his assault. But that's because we don't understand the absolute nature of the son who was raised up by the father to sit upon the throne of his glory, who has total rest on every side. We don't understand and realize the glorious work that is beautifully described in David and Solomon. The picture of the death and the resurrection is vivid in this testimony. The picture of the, the putting away and the establishing of the second is here in this picture. David was a man of blood, a man of war, and had war on every side of him until, until the Lord put all things under the, all enemies, all adversaries under the soles of his feet. In verse First uh, uh, Chronicles twenty two verse eight, going back to First uh, Chronicles twenty two, but in verse eight, the word of the Lord came to me saying, "Thou hast shed blood abundantly." This is him talking to David. You have shed blood abundantly. What a what a phrase. You have made great wars, and thou shalt not build a house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Listen, here's, here's a synopsis. We'll, we'll, we'll hit it piece by piece, but here's a synopsis. The house of God's glory cannot be built while blood is still being shed. The bloodshed and all enemies have to be put under the sole of the foot of the man of war before that house can be built and ruled by a man of rest. And we many times who are under the rule of the man of rest still think that that war is still happening. Therefore, we don't, we're confused with regard to the stability and the glory and the beauty of the house that he has already built. The house can't be built as long as the wars are still raging. The house of God that is filled with God's glory and has his name upon it, built by a son of wisdom cannot be built as long as the enemies are still there and the war is still raging. It was through the abundant shedding of blood and all enemies being put under the foot of David that God could raise up the Solomon and have him rule in rest, peace, and quietness. So you see in that the taking away of the first, the establishing of the second. We're faced with a transition, but a transition that helps define the nature of both distinct yet essential parts of this. David is said to have shed blood in abundance, blood in an abundant measure. And that, that presents the abundance and sufficiency of Christ's death and his victory over sin, where he destroyed the works of the devil entirely. He came to win a total victory over all enemies. 
Paul writes in Hebrews 2, verse 14, seeing then the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself also in like manner did take part of the same, that through death he might destroy him who had power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those who ever with fear of death throughout all their lives were subjects of bondage. That means those under the law and those under the rule of, of Adam, because as long as they were under Adam's rule, they were under the law of Moses' condemnation, and they were in fear of death because of transgression of the law. Always subjects of fear and death because they were automatically because of the government and kingship of sin and death that ruled in them, they were always subject to death because they were always transgressors of the law. The death of Christ, the, notice the language, the death of Christ, the shedding of blood in an abundant measure was to destroy the one with the power of death, to deliver those who were subjects of bondage. And those of us who are now born of God are made beneficiaries of his victory. The victory that was won by the man of war, but not because he'll always fight constant battles that still come upon us as his body. That's how we're taught. But we're now raised together and seated together in the kingdom of the beloved of God, a man of peace who lives and rules a kingdom that has no existing enemy and no evil occurring. The sovereign rule of which I am speaking and that is exercised in us through the presence of the kingdom of God is not his sovereignty in the midst of battle, not his sovereignty in the midst of fighting wars, but it is the true sovereignty that possesses no enemy and no rival because all enemies have been put under the sole of his feet. There is no more war raging. There's no adversary in the realm of Solomon's rule. Please hear this. Please hear this. The first has been taken away completely. The great war is won. The blood is abundantly shed. The second is established in the risen and enthroned Son of God. We're, we're seeing a transition from the reality of Jesus in his earthly ministry who came at the end of the world to take away sin once and for all and the risen Christ in whom there is absolutely no residual effect of that which has been taken away and destroyed, who is dead to it all. John presents both sides of this. In one verse, and this is uh, 1 John 3, 5, I think. And ye know that he was manifested to take away sins, number one, and in him is no sin. See, most people today, most Christians, are still waiting on all enemies to be put under the sole of his feet. This has been done. The war was fought and won by David. David put away all enemies. Solomon now is raised up as a man of rest to give peace and to secure the land in a state of quietness, tranquility. The good news of the gospel is that our king reigns even in the midst of our ignorance. While so many who are born of God, who are under the rule of Solomon, still, still fight imaginary enemies and still are told that there are battles going on every day. Who are ignorant of the sovereignty of our king, who rules with no enemy and no rival. Meaning we over whom he exercises that dominion, just as the land of Solomon's rule, we partake of the beautiful 
tranquility and peace that he has as his own condition. If our, kin if our king has no enemy, we who are his who are his servants in his kingdom have no enemy. He secured for all of his all of his weak and his fragile subjects. He secured for all of us a divinely sure and abounding reality that not one of those subjects, not you, not me could have ever secured for ourselves. The present and perpetual rule of this man of rest has bestowed unto his land over which his dominion is exercised, his own rest, his own peace, his own quietness. And this is so as long as he reigns. And the beauty of that is that of his kingdom, there is no end. Of his authority and kingdom, there is no end. So we are those who should repose and lean back in restfulness in the great certainty of his reign that has no end to it. Jesus says in John 14, 26, in the beautiful uh, chapter 14 of John, he says, peace I leave with you, but whose? My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. See, that's not merely a beautiful thought. It's an anchoring truth in the light of which we should re read so many of the verses that we seemingly have read over with a regrettable sense of familiarity. The verses at the heart of our consideration concerning the kingly dominion of both sin and grace. Under Adam's reign, we could not in any way lessen the magnitude of his power. The rule of Christ over us is much greater and, and much more established and wields kingly power in an undefinable measure. true nature of the kingdom within is secured in God's understanding of it. Our being known of God. He unveils our hearts to that divine reality and that we may know as we are known and live in the certainty and gratefulness and enjoyment of the fullness of the one who resides within and rules from within. His rule is the gracious gift bestowed to his subjects. But as we've said before, the subjects of that kingdom never become equal to the king. They're always subject to the king. They're always under his rule because they're always insufficient in themselves. They must live in the certainty of his rule and not believe that there is anything in themselves that makes them equal to him or of equal quality of he, than him. There's none of that. That's, that's not what happens here. Not I, but Christ is, is one of the greatest, not I, but Christ lives in me, is one of the greatest declarations of the rule of a king that has ever been written. But notice in those verses, you will always notice and consider the distinction that is left between the two. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. It's not Christ living as me. It's not like Christ living through me. It's not an absorption of my being into Christ or Christ being into me. It is a bestowal to me of his own sufficiency never brings me to equal equal equality with him that's not what it's about it is the one partaking of the other for something to be real 
It is my soul partaking of him for anything in my soul to be a reality. He has to be the reality of it. And he has to be that by imputation, by the bestowal of his mercy and kindness to this weak vessel. You don't see an infusion or an entire assumption of personhood of the one by the other. It's not I, but Christ who lives. It's him living so that I can actually have life. The true nature of the kingdom within is secured by God's understanding. His rule is seen here in 1 Kings. And I want to show you something with regard to this. Listen to the words of the Queen of Sheba after her encounter with this great king. And this is something with regard to the subjects of the kingdom. This is after she has come to see Solomon. Because she heard in her own country, in her own land, that this is a queen in her own right, and she learned in the land of her rule that there was a king of excellence. There was an exceeding great king of wisdom and riches beyond any imaginable measure. And she heard about him and heard about him in her own land, and she said, listen, I've got to go see this man for myself. This, what ha this is what has to happen for us here and here and here, but we have to see him for ourselves. Luckily, he's not a far from us. He's in us. Our heart just has to turn to see. But she heard of him, so she came to him. She came with everything, all her riches, all of her wealth, all of the pomp and circumstance of her uh, parade into the into the land of Solomon, and she saw him, and then she hit the floor and fainted in his in his presence, because she saw his greatness, his wisdom, heard his wisdom, saw his greatness, and she couldn't take it; it overwhelmed her. She said to him. It was a true report that I heard from you, about you. But I did not believe their words. Again, we've said this a multitude of times, but that word is amen. There was no amen to their words. Until I saw you. And you exceed. You exceed their words. And the half of who you are and the greatness of your kingdom and the, the glory of your wisdom could not even be told to me. There was no way. But then she says this to him. Happy are your men. Happy are your servants who stand continually before thee and hear your wisdom. Blessed is the Lord thy God who delights in thee. Here, here's the thing now. Who delights in thee in whom I am well pleased. Who delights in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel. Why did he do that for Israel? First, he sets on the throne of Israel the man he delights in. But why does he set that man on the throne? Because he loves Israel. Therefore, he made you their king. See, the fact that he loves Israel is demonstrated in the fact that he has set him on the throne and made him to rule over them. The love of God is granted to us through the presence of Christ's kingdom within. Paul writes, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost given to us. And while the first man ruled as a tyrant over the soul, the king of grace blesses the citizens of his domain with every spiritual blessing. That's the good news of the kingdom of God. It 
So what about the subjects of the kingdom? See, that's what it's always about. Always. It's always about that with us. What about us? What about us? Isn't there supposed to be some great demonstration? Aren't we supposed to exhibit Christ's nest to the world? Aren't we supposed to uh, demonstrate who he is so that people can see him through us? No. They see him by the work of God that calls us to see him, and that is revealing Jesus in the soul. It's the only way. Can't see Jesus in you. No way. The subjects of the kingdom of the beloved son, listen to these words closely, because this answers a question with regard to all of our concepts about what about the vessels? Is it Christ through me? Is it Christ as me? Does, the, does Christ in me, is that sufficient? Or should there be these extra steps of Christ through me and Christ as me and manifesting and expressing? Subjects of the kingdom of the beloved son exhibit the joy, the happiness of his reign. Joy unspeakable, full of glory, because we are the subjects of the dominion of his rule and therefore partake of the glories of his person. Because he lives, we live also. Because he has peace, we have peace, his peace. But listen, the queen of Sheba never went to one of his servants and never went to one of his subjects and asked them to display the glories of this kingdom. She went directly to the king because although the subjects display the joy and the happiness of his rule, of being those who are subjects of his, of his uh, divine reign and who hear his wisdom and know his glory, and the riches and the exceeding greatness of his kingdom. The subjects are not equipped and never will be equipped to be equally capable of displaying the exceeding nature and divine wisdom of his kingship and his enthronement. We're not capable of such. We have no capacity there. We are not the ones people should come to and say, show me the kingdom of God. For this is a kingdom that has no external observation. Listen. We'll say, uh, what about the place where it says that he causes us a, a, the triumph in Christ Jesus and, and, and makes by us a, uh, let me show you, let me go here real quick. This is, I um, had this pulled up so I could read it. Thanks be to God who causes us to triumph in Christ makes by us the savor of his knowledge in every place. And so we, we, we take those words and we think, see, there is something for us to do. We have to be the exhibition of the savor of his knowledge in every place. So what do we think? That means go out and just uh, be like Jesus, imitate, act like. So much so that we have it down to a theology, like is Christ, I wish I had the book here, but it's Christ in me, living as me, through me. What? I have a book here. I'm not going to show it to you because it's perversion. But it is a, it is a thick book, hundreds of pages of God-awful gunk because we want to have something to do with it. We want to be the exhibition of him. We want to be the manifestation of him. But if you go to the verses and actually read it and actually study it out, it's not about us manifesting anything. Listen to the words. This is, uh, and, and multiple, multiple places say this. Many commentaries will say the same thing. But it talks about him being the head of a procession, the head of a, a 
procession of his victory. Now, King James says he always causes us to triumph, but it's actually, when you look it up and you study it out, and I'm telling you to do so, don't take my word for it, it's talking about not him giving us a victory and parading us about as victorious. It's about him being the head of a procession that is a declaration of his victory. What about us in that procession? He leads us in that procession, but we have to understand something about a kingdom overcoming another kingdom and what happened when that took place. When that took place, go back to 70 AD, it happened when uh, the, the Roman armies destroyed Jerusalem. Same thing happened there and throughout history it's happened. There would be this this procession, this parade throughout the city uh, where he had taken a kingdom and now he was bringing back the riches of that kingdom and the spoils of that kingdom and he was prisoners and they would parade through the city as the conquerors of a kingdom and would lead in a procession the spoils and the trophies showing that that king is a conqueror and they who follow that king are the conquered. They're the conquered, not the conquerors. He leads us in a procession that proves to the universe, to God and all the universe, his victory. And we are led by him in that procession as his spoils, as his conquered ones, and display in the midst a savor of the knowledge of his rule and his kingship, because we're not conquerors, we are the conquered. And as those who are the conquered, we are dead to the thing that he conquered, meaning death, sin, and the kingdom of darkness. We've already talked about that. But a king has overcome another kingdom, and we are the spoils. Here it is. There are three things here on each of which I touch belonging to the true notion of the Christian life. The conquered captive that captive partaking in the triumph of his conqueror and the conquered captive led as a trophy and a witness of the conqueror's power. That's what he's talking about here. We are the captive, let's see, the conquered captives, Slaves of righteousness, therefore dead to sin. We are conquered captives, and the captive partaking in the triumph of his conqueror, meaning being led in a procession displaying we are the conquered of this great conqueror. These three things, and I'm sorry, the conquered captive led as a trophy. As a trophy, as a spoil of his conquering of a of another kingdom, as the greater king that is now conquered. That's what we are. We are the conquered who are who are the displaying to the universe, not in anything we do. That's the thing that gets me. When we talk about the church, we're always talking about the church has to show this off. And we think that's what Paul says in Ephesians. But the fact is the very existence of the church itself, in that it exists as his body, in that it exists as his kingdom, is the exhibition to all the universe of the wisdom of God made manifest. The fact that we exist as his body is the exhibition of his victory and of his rule and of his greatness. It's not about us in any way. I'm sorry. It's about him who lives and rules within us. And as long as he rules, we are the beneficiaries and we are the partakers of the victory in that because we are his conquered ones, because we are spoils of his victory, we are now victorious over the previous thing that held us captive. And we become captives of a greater king, subjects of a greater kingdom, partakers 
of the kindness of the beloved of God in whom we live safely, securely, at peace and quietness. There is a lot of confusion today about the kingdom of God within us. So we have questions like, is the rule of Christ, is his reign a progressive or a cumulative reign? Does it grow in power and dominion? Does it grow in influence over us over a period of time? Or does it increase in degree or force with successive additions added to it? This is how many Christians view the kingdom of God, at least those who do view it as an internal reality at all. And this ideology has done a great bit of damage by causing most Christians to validate the rule of the kingdom by some measurable external proof. But Jesus explicitly describes the nature of the kingdom, and he says the kingdom of God comes not with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And so we'll have men say yes for a moment in time until it can be manifested through us. And that's it. So, <laughs> that's not what Jesus says. Because if it is manifested through us, there has to be someone that's able to observe it. And it is not observable by ocular evidence. That's what the word observation means. No ocular evidence. The exegetical dictionary of the New Testament reads, according to Luke 17, 20, Jesus rejects the question of the Pharisees concerning the timing of the kingdom coming as inappropriate. The kingdom of God does not come in a way that can be observed by external means or signs. The issue may be less that of calculating a specific time than the view that the coming and the presence of the kingdom must be recognizable by phenomena that are clearly discernible. And it's very sad that our expectation of the kingdom differs very little from that of the Pharisees. Some of us may not be expecting it to fall out of the sky, but we're still expecting the same ex external, measurable, discernible proof, whether it's through us or whatever. kingdom of God is present because the king himself is present. And as long as he's present, the soul is in a state of quietness and peace. Don't let any man preach to you something that uproots and takes away that peace and that quietness. Stand still so that God can show you the greatness of the king's rule. And so you can live as those under Solomon happy and enjoying God's love and God's favor bestowed to us in the fact that he rules and reigns. In 1 John, I see this rule presented in a way that most people don't understand. It says, whosoever is born of God, and this is 1 John 3 and 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for the seed, his seed, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now, if we're looking for external proofs here, then we're going to be a long time battling with this verse, as I did for many, many years. But to me, this verse beautifully presents the immensity of his saving and sustaining rule and reign. John's not stating a condition that has been thoroughly, uh, uh, what's the word, thoroughly validated. By um, external proofs external evidences. He's describing a state of being for those who are born of God, a state of being. 
that is ensured solely upon the foundation of the abiding of a seed, his continual presence, and I could say his sovereign rule in us. He's not qualifying what he's stating here beyond being born of God. And that's important to understand. That's important to note here. John understood <clears throat> that being born of God constitutes a condition within us that cannot be achieved or proven by our actions. He's sure to anchor the certainty of an internal condition in the unmovability and abiding presence of Christ himself, Christ in us, Christ in us, <coughs> excuse me, Christ in us is the awesome and yet naturally undiscernible proof of our soul's spiritual stability. The rule of God's kingdom, this is a sure, sure statement. The rule of God's kingdom within is not manifestly proven by a series of cumulative actions or additions or acquisitions. It is proven entirely by singular and fully sufficient internal provision or imputation of all things pertaining unto life and godliness. <clears throat> My hope in these lessons is to just let you know, those who hear this, to try to impress upon us that the new birth is the greatest exhibition of the autonomy, the sovereignty and power of our king. And it is the ultimate proof of his rule. In this one divine work, God has exerted his sovereignty within the soul of all who believe, bringing those souls from death to life, from darkness to light, from sin to righteousness, from enemies to to no enemy at all. He spoiled the enemy, delivered us from the tyranny of our previous master, our previous king. We did not crawl or walk or run from death to life. We were brought there by the power of someone who alone had that cap capability, who himself became dead to it all and lives now unto God, untouched and unreachable by any of the things he's dead to. And he bestows that state of being to those who believe and those who are under his rule. We are sustained there in that condition by the constancy of his enthronement. Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will raise unto David a righteous branch. A king shall reign and prosper, execute judgment and justice in the earth. And in his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. What did we just say? Christ made unto us righteousness. Notice that. There are many still waiting on this to be fulfilled. They're still longing for the days in which Judah will be saved and Israel will be secured. However, the name of this king, the Lord our righteousness, is truly the name by which the salvation and security of all of us who are subjects of his rule are ensured today. So that we can boast in nothing but him. Not in ourselves, not in the fact that we have been 
brought by successive actions, activities, additions, or divine work brought up to an equality with God where we are one in being and one in essence. No, that's not it. It's not it. I want you to see this. Pile of rubbish. I'm going to quote you one quote from this. Jesus and us. This is the ultimate aim of God. Listen to this. This is the ultimate aim of God. Jesus and us utterly together sharing the sameness of of form and being. Are you kidding me? Notice how Paul makes God the source of all of this. All of this. He makes Christ the subject substance of all of this. Christ's presence provides and perpetuates a government of perfect righteousness. And this government of righteousness doesn't have its source or its hope of endurance in us at all. The next step is nothing about us. It's not about anything having to do with the vessel. It's always and exclusively joined to the riches in the vessel, leaving us with no ground of boasting, no ground of hope, except in the sufficiency of him as the source and the sustainer. I was made aware of a book a long time or a while back, not a long time ago, but a few, few weeks ago by the name of outdoing Jesus. And the book is a, I think a symptom of a misunderstanding of Christ's sovereignty, or maybe it's a blatant desire to achieve and assume some ground for self boasting, some equality and even ascendancy beyond Christ. Because we still see Jesus in so much of the church, and this is a dangerous thing, as a pattern for us to follow and not the fulfillment of a previous pattern. And, and he fulfills it entirely, leaving us with nothing to fulfill, but being the vessels filled by him who is the fulfillment of it all. Therefore, Paul could say complete in him. We still preach Jesus as a pattern so that what he did, we can do, and how he acted, we can act that way. I hope we understand how perverse that really is. Get down to it. Sounds all spiritual. Oh boy, what a what a spiritual pursuit. It's a pursuit of perversion. To see Jesus as a mere pattern for men to live by. Totally disregarding the messianic fulfillment that he is. The Messiah that he is. Not just man's Messiah, but God's. God's entire intention fully embodied. And we call him a pattern because we're really what God was after. What a joke. Outdoing Jesus. What a, what a, wow. But in the midst of that, I also want to read you just the title of that book alone is enough to make you want to vomit. And then here's a quotation by a respected theologian, St. Augustine, St. Augustine, however you want to pronounce it. The quote reads, pray as though everything depends on God and work as though everything depends on you. See, this sounds like a well-balanced Christian life a well-balanced view of our salvation, but I'm going to tell you what it is. It is still speculating upon the, upon the fact that in this land ruled by this King, there is something that, that is an enemy. There's still an obstruction, something still not done. These, these, that, that does not pass. That is not a balanced view. It is, presenting an unsettled, uncertain condition for the believer. 
Augustine is telling us to place some confidence in God, some confidence in the sufficiency of Christ. Some confidence in the greater than Solomon, who is a man of rest and peace over uh, around whom there is no enemy. And so the land benefits of his rule. It's not what he's saying. Telling us to doubt that. He's bringing doubt and shade upon that very thing. And just in case God's power is not enough, we have to do our part to make sure that the thing gets sufficiently done work and perform, exert energies like the entire weight of our soul salvation could possibly actually rest upon our shoulder. That's a dreadful excuse for the gospel. I've said this before, but that's a catastrophic consideration. If we understood, it took a moment just to think about it. I remind you that Paul makes God the source of both being in Christ and of all the abiding benefits of his sovereign act, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. under the heading of wisdom of God. I think that sets forth the man of wisdom. All of these things being provided under that heading wisdom, I think it ties us right back to Solomon and the kingship of Solomon over the land. If salvation does not have 100% or is not 100% based its beginning and its continuance secured in the presence of Christ 100%, we have no hope. Not at all. Salvation is, in fact, a kind, merciful king internally ruling his land, his subjects, and providing to those us weak vessels all that does not belong to them and is not in their reach to any degree. No spiritual reality, no blessing belongs to us outside of the context of his sovereignty, his rule. The sovereignty and rule that has bestowed or imputed to us his divine substance in the midst of our innate emptiness. This is the certainty that undergirds our soul. Sadly, however, most people attempt to define the greatness of Christ's rule by observing the earthen vessel instead of the riches of the vessel or the riches that are in the vessel, said that way. They assess the zeal that they observe and how perfectly they seem to live daily and see this has caused so many to add to the story most of what we call the gospel or christian living is an addition to the story that is not necessary and is certainly not biblical We add to the story and we place evidence and observable manifestation as the real expectation of the believer. It's the true ultimate aim of God. It's what God can do through us or what Christ will manifest as us. And these are invalid hopes set forth by those who are not content with a salvation that is entirely out of our hands and beyond our reach, but imputed to us by God's grace. Because they still seek a salvation that is an infusion of his divinity with our humanity. It infuses the two together and makes it one. 
instead and that what that does and what they hope that will do in their presentation is make the two his divinity our humanity make the two indiscernible so that it can be again using jesus as a as a pattern for us we can say two without my tongue falling out of my mouth because it is so perverse i can say too if you have seen me you've seen the father Sorry, there's only one that could ever say that. They are teaching, many are teaching, many not understanding this, what we're talking about, still have their hopes set on this infusion. They believe salvation is an infusion between the divine and the humane, or the humanity and the divinity, the divinity and the humanity that make the two equal, indiscernible, mingling and fusing the two together. That's what they're after. So that I become a pure, unadulterated manifestation of the divine in the midst of the world. And every person who has hopes in that and hopes in you for that are deceived and will be soon very, very disappointed. But there is no disappointment of setting our hope upon him because those who want that infusion of the divinity and the humanity and want the two to be indiscernible, here's the truth. We are looking in salvation at an imputation of his mercy, not an infusion, but an imputation of his mercy to these weak vessels of clay. So that as Paul would write, the distinction between the vessel of clay and the excellent riches that are in that vessel that distinction is always understood to be. It is evident that there is that distinction between the clay and the divine riches that are immeasurable in value. He has placed the riches in earthen vessels, not so they can be mingled together and be indiscernible, but Paul would say, so that the excellency of the power may be evidently understood to be of him and not of us. So that there will be a true, you want observable? A true distinction between the excellent and the inferior, the sufficient, and the weak. Most of these people, they will still concede that Christ is in us. And then they'll call into question the certainty of his rule because they don't see that perfect exhibition. So they'll say, yes, he's in us, but it's obvious that he doesn't reign yet. He doesn't rule. He's not king yet. What does that actually mean? And how is that conclusion even reached? It stems from the influence of Christian teachings that make our lifestyle, our observable exhibitions in the world, the ultimate issue, the ultimate aim. While actually absolutely ignoring the power performance of a divine life bestowed to us by new birth. The one making the judgment concerning the validation of your Christian evidence or your Christian experience is not convinced due to what they see as a lack of proof. What would be an evidence? What would give sufficient proof that we are entirely ruled? by Christ. Take a quick look at the multiple denominations that have particular methods to determine a person's level of holiness or sanctification. Which do you choose? I mean, their accepted measurements are as innumerable as, as the organizations and as innumerable as those denominations, biblical interpretations. The evidence of your soul's condition is not measured externally, but internally. The internal measure is indeed 
Again, the, the, the soul's design is to have this rule that determines the soul's condition. That's what it was all about. The internal measure is indeed immeasurable by any recognized method. I question. What method are you looking for? What evidence do you think will prove perfection. There are so many who still question the certainty of Christ's rule in the soul because to many, certainty of his rule is verified by how well and consistent the external evidence lines up. And I stress again that being born again is the most unblemished proof of his reign. Nothing, nothing subsequent, nothing additional to that one all-sufficient work makes his sovereign rule greater. Remember, his grace is super abounding in us. The glorious king is the one whom the spirit of God makes known. We can't enhance the sufficiency of his dominion. We are growing in a greater acknowledgement of the power and presence of his kingdom within. It doesn't make it more powerful or more present or more effectual. It makes us aware so that we can rightly enjoy that kingdom and his rule and live in the acknowledgement of all the benefits of it. When you hear the question, does he reign in you yet? Are you hearing the equivalent to, are you born again yet? You should, because that's the same. When they call that into question, is he really reigning in you? That's equivalent to saying, are you born yet of God? Are you dead to sin and alive to God yet? Are you a new creation yet? Are you in Christ yet? Because I have encountered people who are convinced that they're not even yet in Christ because they still see the things in themselves that they believe disqualify them from that condition. But I always say to disqualify yourself, you have to first be qualified and you weren't. They see a seeming incongruence between the confession and the conduct. But it is a profession of faith in that we lean entirely upon the sufficiency of him and not ourselves. Our confession, our profession is not one of confidence in ourselves and our abilities. It shouldn't be. It's a trust a full-on, wholehearted trust that the king who rules in us overrides and superabounds in the midst of our incapacity, our insufficiency, and our weakness. Not that one day we'll be equal. Not one day there will be a sense of equality between the two, but that he overrules and does rule in the midst of our insufficiency. And our insufficiency cannot uproot his sufficiency. And this, again, does not excuse misconduct, but it places the certainty of a state of being upon the presence of Christ's unchangeableness and not our vacillation. So to end this, let me go to one place, Isaiah 52. We've read this before in places, in lessons. I think it's important to look at as in the light of a salvation that is described by the sovereignty, the sovereign rule of the greater than Solomon within us. So Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, publishes salvation, and who says to Zion, your God reigns. Again, 
and this is not a, just a prophecy yet to be accomplished, your God reigns. Paul actually uh, uses this very prophet in Romans 10, this very thing when he says in Romans 10, 14, how then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him who they did not hear? And how shall they hear apart from one preaching? And how shall they preach if they have not been sent? According as it has been written, how beautiful the feet of those proclaiming good tidings of peace, of those proclaiming good tidings of the good things. What's the good tidings of the good things? What's the declaration of peace? Hear that? Because that's the state of the rule of Solomon, right? The state of the king's rule is of peace good. So we back up just a little bit more because I want to contextualize this and, and realize what this reign is all about. Cause he says in verse 10 of Romans 10, he says, for with the heart doth one believe to righteousness and with a mouth is confession made to salvation for the scripture says, everyone who is believing on him shall not be ashamed for there is no difference between Jew and Greek for the same Lord of all is rich to all those calling upon him for everyone, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be saved. The good tidings of the good things is that those who have called on the Lord are saved. And those who are believing on him are not ashamed. Notice. Paul does not explicitly say that God reigns or does he? Here's the question. Because in the light of what we've read concerning the reign of Solomon, peace, safety, that ruled the land as long as he was on the throne, it stated that salvation by faith and believing under righteousness is the moment when the king of righteousness and peace takes up his rule and causes there to be rest and peace and safety internally. Your God reigns. You are the subject of a king who has bestowed, imputed his righteousness, his peace, his state of quietness with no enemy or rival. Set our hearts to know the glory of this king, the excellency of him who sits upon his throne. He's not fighting wars. His reign is proof that the war is over. And righteousness reigns. I hope this has helped. I hope this has in some way been a blessing. Let me know. These things are weightier matters. I've said these things before, but more and more there. I know the necessity of these things in the body of Christ. I know that they're necessary to hear. Most do not hear these things. Most are not hearing these things. That's sad. I want us to understand how sufficient he is, how sovereign his rule is, and how that sovereign rule has been a bestowal of all things to the soul. We're not lacking anything because we are subjects of his rule. May we set our hearts to know him, see him, that we may live as those who are happy, and enjoying the love of God that has made him king over us. Thank you guys for um, your patience in listening to this. I'm sure I went way beyond time, but I just needed to get this out, and I hope it has helped. Remember the conference. Let us know if we can be of any help getting you here and helping you uh, get accommodations. So love you very much. Amen. <laughs>